The brutal age of dinosaurs vanished 65 million years ago. Now a strange mystery has been discovered in a remote corner of the world. Something's going on here and we really don't understand it. 68 huge Tyrannosaur skeletons found in one place. What happened? There's lots of skeletons here of animals that may have all died together and it's always puzzled people. One scientist has a shocking answer. They hunted in deadly, bloodthirsty packs. But his theory meets tough resistance. I doubt the idea would even cross their tiny reptile brains. Mammals were thought to have been the first organized hunters millions of years after the dinosaurs. A pack of hunting tyrannosaurs would have been the deadliest and most terrifying thing imaginable. That's the stuff of nightmares. You wouldn't have a chance. It's a bold idea, but can he prove it? His quest for evidence takes him into the company of the world's most dangerous killers. And into the darkest corners of T-Rex's head, it raises some scary questions. In the past, we were just trying to figure out what tyrannosaurs were. Now we're actually trying to find out who they were. If dinosaurs hadn't become extinct, would gangs of killer tyrannosaurs now rule the world? Would mankind have survived in such a deadly place? Dinosaur expert Dr. Phil Curry has found the fossilized leg of a tyrannosaur in the Gobi Desert. He hopes it will reveal something about the hunting ability of these deadly creatures. Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Home to 10 million people and to the latest technology for analyzing fossils. Dr. Curry is taking his fossil to a specialized laboratory on the outskirts of the city. It's kind of like Christmas, you know, and you, you finally see the specimens in the lab, and for the first time you can actually take them out one at a time, lay them out on a table, and uh, see what you manage to accomplish. First, the Gobi fossils are catalogued and stored. Now the real work begins. Very often people think that the excavation is the end of the deal, but it's not, it's just the beginning. Preparing the fossilized bones for analysis is a painstaking process. First, the protective plaster jacket has to be cut away. Once the plaster has been removed, the remaining rock has to be chipped away from the bone. This is a very exciting part of the process. It's starting to put all those pieces together in, in the jigsaw puzzle. Only when the surrounding rock is removed is the actual fossil revealed. To the trained eye, it's a window onto a world that vanished 65 million years ago. When you look at these bones, sometimes you forget that uh, these represent an animal that was the height of its evolution. This Tyrannosaur is probably the most efficient killing machine that existed during the late Cretaceous times. But how does such a heavy animal manage to chase and hunt prey so successfully? The museum display shows how dramatically tyrannosaurs change proportions as they grow from youngsters into adults. The adults were massive bodied, clearly slow and moving, whereas the juveniles were lightly built, fast running animals. This is the vital key to Dr. Curry's theory of a fast moving gang of deadly killers. Analyzing the foot bones of a juvenile tyrannosaur, Dr. Curry reveals an extraordinary fact. 
when we compare the length of these three bones to the length of the upper leg bone, the thigh bone, we see that uh, in the juveniles, these are more than two-thirds the length of the upper leg bones. When your bones in the lower part of the leg and the foot are long compared to the upper part of the leg, mechanically, you're better equipped for running faster. Then, as the youngsters grow up, they undergo a remarkable transformation. The proportions change dramatically so that the foot bones are two-thirds the length of the femur, no more than that. As the animal gets bigger, the smaller these bones are in terms of length compared to the other leg bones. And that's more like what we see in something like an elephant that would allow the animal to move its enormous weight around. But it might have meant that the adult tyrannosaurs were much slower at running than the juveniles. As adults, tyrannosaurs need thicker, heavier bones to support their massive bulk, big skulls, and huge killer jaws. We know by comparison of proportions of the juveniles to the adults that the juveniles were animals that were capable of running much faster. But how fast is that? Often the best way to understand these ancient animals is to compare them with modern ones. One modern animal with the same body proportions as a juvenile Tyrannosaurus is the ostrich. Ostriches are the fastest two-legged runners on Earth. If juvenile tyrannosaurs have the same leg proportions as an ostrich, would that give them the speed and agility to hunt in killer gangs? Dinosaur expert Dr. Phil Curry is on a mission to prove that tyrannosaurs hunted in deadly packs. Though the adults may have been too heavy for a long chase, Dr. Curry discovers that young tyrannosaurs could have been very fast runners. Dr. Curry now travels to South Africa in search of the world's fastest two-legged runner, the ostrich. This bird's body proportions resemble those of a juvenile tyrannosaur. Dr. Curry wants to see if the young predators might have been able to run at a similar speed. It's pretty amazing watching ostriches run across the veld because, you know, they're so much like tyrannosaurs. You know, they really boot it, they go fast. The amazing thing, I guess, is just that they're so maneuverable. It's no coincidence that these extraordinary birds resemble tyrannosaurs. Birds are in fact descended from two-legged dinosaurs. Their erect stance, uh, their capacity for fast running and large body sizes are much more similar to what we get in birds and mammals than to what we see in reptiles. A baby tyrannosaurus has about the same build as an ostrich. And so if you want to understand what they were capable of, it's a good idea if you can understand what ostriches are capable of. Ostriches can reach speeds close to 45 miles per hour. That's twice as fast as an Olympic sprinter. Could a young tyrannosaur be capable of this kind of speed? To know how fast they may have run, Dr. Curry needs to find out if their muscles were also similar. Looking at a modern ostrich then gives us a clue as to how the musculature in a tyrannosaur may have behaved and also gives us a clue on how the whole leg may have in fact mechanically moved. Exposing an ostrich's leg muscles, veterinarian Dr. Jan Forster shows Dr. Curry the closest thing to a tyrannosaur's leg he will ever see. The amazing thing to me is just that, um, you know, when you look at these joints, they really aren't different at all from the dinosaurs. These animals have the bulk of the muscles concentrated up top. And once you get into the lower part of the leg, everything is run by tendons and ligaments, and they give it a certain amount of spring. The key to the ostrich's speed 
lies in its elongated metatarsal foot bones, which give it a longer stride. The limb bone proportions in a baby tyrannosaur is so close to what we see in ostriches, we can't help but think that the lever system we're seeing is exactly what we would expect to see in a tyrannosaur. This means that a young tyrannosaur would have been capable of the same speed as an ostrich. 485. Close to 45 miles per hour. But what about the adults? T-Rex just didn't have enough muscle to be able to run very fast for an animal of its size. Dr. Curry wants to try to calculate the speed of a fully grown Tyrannosaurus to know if it was capable of hunting prey. 4-4. Four, four. Although no two-legged animal alive today can be compared to a big Tyrannosaurus, there is a place that can work out its approximate speed. The Royal Veterinary College, Hatfield, England. The most cutting-edge institute of its kind anywhere in the world. Scientist John Hutchinson will try to measure just how fast a Tyrannosaurus could run. All we have for dinosaurs, unfortunately, is largely the bones and occasionally some footprints. So how can we reconstruct what they might have behaved like? Well, animals are generally made of the same stuff. Muscle is muscle, bone is bone. So we can apply what we know from living animals and the laws of physics to dinosaurs and reconstruct them. Dr. Hutchinson's high-speed cameras have filmed all kinds of running animals, from horses to cheetahs. Today, much like an ostrich or a tyrannosaur, it's a two-legged runner. Set, go. Force receptors in the lab floor measure the impact of the runner's foot. Computers record the movement of the runner's white markers and build an accurate digital model of his motion and speed. Go. All the information is then gathered into the computer model, where the results can be analyzed. There are certain principles of movement that apply from ants to elephants. The force of the limb on the ground goes up very quickly and reaches a peak about at mid-step of around two and a half times body weight. That means a 200-pound runner's leg must support 500 pounds of force each time his foot lands. For a six-ton adult tyrannosaur, that's an incredible force of 15 tons smashing into each leg. So that's a lot of force on one leg. You need really big leg muscles to prevent the limb from collapsing. Such an immense load would force the animal's leg to change shape as it grows, becoming stronger and broader by the time it reaches adulthood. This, of course, increased disproportionately. And the bigger you get, the thicker you become, which means you become even bigger yet. If a young Tyrannosaurus can run at 45 miles per hour, what does Dr. Hutchinson predict for a charging six-ton adult? A large tyrannosaur might have been able to run somewhere between 15 to 25 miles per hour. Between youth and adulthood, that's a decrease in top speed from 45 to 25 miles per hour. John Hutchinson's work clearly shows that uh, the larger the tyrannosaur, the slower it's going to be. Dr. Curry has clearly revealed that young tyrannosaurs were fast and would have had no trouble chasing down just about any potential prey. He's also shown that fully grown adults would have brought up the rear at half the speed, perhaps to deliver a massive killer bite. But his detractors still disagree. In their view, adult tyrannosaurs were too slow to hunt in a pack. As they got bigger and they got heavier and more ponderous, there's no pursuit. I think they would have moved more to an ambush style of predation. For Dr. Curry, this view of a solitary ambushing tyrannosaur doesn't mesh with the adult skeletons found together in Alberta and the Gobi Desert. He's still convinced that T-Rex hunted in packs. But he's prepared to test his theory further. What I need to understand at this stage is what are the other possible explanations I can come up with 
to explain why we get so many tyrannosaurs grouped together. One possibility is to look at another survivor from the prehistoric world. To do that, Dr. Curry must travel to a land that time forgot. The kingdom of the Komodo dragon, the largest carnivorous lizard on Earth. These prehistoric survivors will finally unlock the mystery of the Gobi skeletons. Dinosaur expert Dr. Phil Curry believes that tyrannosaurs hunted in killer packs. His discovery that young tyrannosaurs were fast runners is solid evidence that supports his theory. But how did the slower adults move with the gang? Dr. Curry's detractors say they didn't. They either ambushed prey or were scavengers. To test this idea, Dr. Curry wants to look at a prehistoric scavenger that has survived millions of years in a remote corner of the world. Dr. Curry's quest takes him to Indonesia, a chain of 17,000 islands that crisscrosses the equator. One of the wonderful things about being a paleontologist is that you're looking at ancient life to try and bring it back to life again. And the only way we can really do that is to look at things that actually represent what dinosaurs were. On the island of Rinka in the Komodo National Park, the Komodo dragon is the undisputed apex predator. What might these giant lizards tell Dr. Curry about how tyrannosaurs fed themselves 65 million years ago? Clearly seeing big animals like Komodo dragons and how they interact is going to teach me a lot. I'll walk away with a much better understanding of the animals that I study, tyrannosaurs. When Dr. Curry finally comes face to face with the killer lizards, they are moving in on a potential prey. He must tread carefully, as the dragons are quick to attack and very dangerous. From a safe distance, he can see how much they look like dinosaurs. I look at that skull, it just says Parvosaurus. I mean, <laughs> we look at the, uh, the front of the snout, we see it's, it's, it's very broad across the front. It's almost like a Tyrannosaur that way. The teeth, you can just make out when he opens his mouth. And all we really see is the tips. Those teeth are recurved, facing back into the throat. They're serrated, just like Tyrannosaur teeth as well. Komodos have 60 razor-sharp teeth, similar to Tyrannosaurs. And they have the same dental program. Komodo dragons and dinosaurs had a rather unique way of avoiding the dentist. Basically what they did was every time the tooth got to a certain age, they would drop it from their mouths and replace it with a brand new one. And Komodo dragons replace their teeth at an incredible rate. There's three or four sets of teeth in every position uh, every year. This continual replacement guarantees a massive killer bite every time. The longer teeth are older. The shorter teeth are the new growth. And the claws, wow. You know, with the musculature on those legs, you can see that those claws would do an awful lot of damage just as much as the Tyrannosaur. But did Tyrannosaurs get their food like the Komodo dragons? These lethal lizards are carnivores, and though they are mostly scavengers, they will also hunt all kinds of mammals, birds and reptiles, and even humans. They use a deadly snake-like poison that prevents blood from clotting, causing severe loss in blood pressure, which sends their prey into shock. The dragons then wait for their victim to weaken and die. Then they close in. This tactic allows them to kill large animals without a fight. 
Now that I've seen a Komodo dragon in the wild, and I have a better sense of how it's moving and interacting at least with its mates, what I need to see now is how these animals actually feed. Did the slower adult tyrannosaurs hunt their prey in similar fashion? Or did they have to rely on scavenging to survive? Paleontologist Dr. Phil Curry has journeyed to a remote Indonesian island to find an ancient reptile scavenger. He wants to see if these survivors of the age of dinosaurs can shed some light on the way adult tyrannosaurs hunted. The dragons are closing in on a water buffalo. They just need to get close enough for one deadly bite. This time, their prey gets away. They didn't get that close, but they tried. Now, obviously, they can't catch the water buffalo by running. Uh, it's much faster than they are, but I think if they got very, very close, then at that point, they would have behaved very, very differently and would have been fast and aggressive. There are dragons all over the island. It only takes one of them to be successful for all the others to eat. Komodo dragons can smell a dying animal up to six miles away. Two days ago, the dragons managed to wound this wild pig. One dead animal brings in the carnivores from many, many miles away. It's a feeding frenzy. I don't think this animal is going to last for another 10 minutes, and it's only been 10 minutes so far. Now, for the first time, Dr. Curry can picture what a Tyrannosaurus feeding frenzy might have looked like. I don't think any hadrosaur had a chance with a couple of Tyrannosaurus eating at it. Komodo dragons can eat up to 80% of their body weight in one sitting. I think that uh, in all probability, Tyrannosaurs did exactly this thing. That would mean that a five-ton Tyrannosaurus would have been able to consume an astonishing four tons of meat at a time. The most revealing moment comes as the dragons finish their meal. They have consumed every last bit of the wild pig. Hair, skin, hooves, bones and all. This could explain the mystery of the missing herbivore fossils in the Gobi Desert. You know, I've often wondered why we find so many tarbosaur skeletons in Mongolia. The fact that we don't find duck-billed dinosaur skeletons, that we don't find other small dinosaur skeletons. Perhaps the Tarbosaurus just completely dismembered them and ate them 100%. We have evidence from Tyrannosaur feces that are just entirely made up of crushed bone fragments. Observing the Komodos, Dr. Curry can see that however similar their eating habits might be to those of a Tyrannosaur, there is one big difference. Komodo dragons are basically scavengers, and when they do hunt, it is definitely not as an organized pack. Many Komodo dragons will follow the same prey animal around for a long time. They're not hunting cooperatively, they're just going where the meat is. Dr. Curry is sure Tyrannosaurs hunted very differently. I think now we've got to take this a little bit further and look at the other possibility that Tyrannosaurs, in fact, did hunt cooperatively. Dr. Curry can finally see the proof of his dino gang's theory coming together. He has shown that Tyrannosaurs did have the build and the speed for pack hunting. But did they have the highly developed senses and, crucially, the brain to hunt cooperatively?
Hoping to find an answer to this question, Dr. Curry now travels to Athens, Ohio, where cutting-edge dinosaur research is taking place. Dr. Curry has come here to meet Dr. Larry Whitmer, who he hopes will shed light on how these ancient killers might have behaved. We never used to think that we could ever come up with something like the behavior of an animal that lived 70 million years ago. We've got new ways of looking at these things now that are opening up new vistas for reconstructing and understanding the behavior of extinct animals. Using CT scanning, Dr. Whitmer's research will allow Dr. Curry to go where he has never gone before, inside the head of a Tyrannosaurus. What CT scanning has done, because it uses x-rays, it allows us, without even touching the fossil, to peer inside, to sort of reveal the secrets the time has kept from our eyes by peering through the bone, peering through the rock that still entombs the fossil. And what that allows us to do is to see some things that time has stripped away. The idea with CT scans is it uses x-rays to sort of slice up something like a loaf of bread. The x-rays will, in a sense, millimeter by millimeter, fraction of a millimeter by fraction of a millimeter, slice up that skull. Now Dr. Curry will get his first ever view of a Tyrannosaur's brain cavity. It's actually really exciting. It's almost the same kind of excitement that a field paleontologist gets as he sort of carefully brushes the sand and dirt away that have covered the fossil for millions of years. In the same way, we are seeing things that no one has ever seen before. Will this peak inside a Tyrannosaur's head finally prove that they lived and hunted in deadly organized gangs? Dr. Phil Curry wants to find out if Tyrannosaur's brains were sufficiently evolved to enable them to hunt in organized packs. To do this, he's ventured where no man has gone before, inside the head of a Tyrannosaurus. In a cutting-edge laboratory at Ohio University, Dr. Curry and Dr. Larry Whitmer are putting the skull of a 70 million year old Tyrannosaurus through a CT scan. As the scan probes the skull's nooks and crannies, the long extinct animal appears to come alive. Now Dr. Curry begins to see the final proof of his pack hunting theory take shape before his eyes. Instead of just being sort of isolated skeletal features, all of a sudden, soft tissues start, in a sense, dripping off of the skeleton. Blood vessels and nerves start issuing forth from holes in the skull. The, the sides of the bones become clothed in muscle. We start to see a living, breathing animal emerge before our eyes. Mapping the inside of the skull, the scan clearly shows the size and shape of the dinosaur's brain. This space right in the middle here actually houses the brain. So what we can do is use this computer software to build up slice by slice and we can start to see what the brain itself looks like. The brain shows large olfactory bulbs. This means the Tyrannosaurus had a very good sense of smell. It also appears to have had large optic nerves which would mean good vision. Its eye sockets faced forwards, giving it good binocular vision. In modern animals, binocular vision is found mainly in predators. It allows them to more accurately detect prey and gauge distance and movement while hunting. If tyrannosaurs didn't hunt, they would not have needed the accurate depth perception that binocular vision gave them. The CT scan is also able to determine the length and shape of the inner ear. 
the spiral canals that affect agility and balance in animals. These canals of the inner ear right here are very long and delicate, suggesting that the sense of balance and equilibrium was very highly developed in Tyrannosaurus. But the inner ear has other functions, something that all predators have stability of gaze. We can imagine this by focusing your eyes on the tip of your finger. And if you move the tip of your finger, the image blurs. But it turns out that if you actually turn your head around, the image remains sharp. So that as the head turns, the eye muscles are constantly making these adjustments, these compensating movements to keep that image fixed and in focus. In the back of the head is a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which controls movements and motor coordination. It winds up that the cerebellum in Tyrannosaurus is a pretty large, complex portion of the brain, suggesting that, in fact, agility and motor coordination were very important. These were probably animals that were fairly jumpy, relatively quick movements. Certainly the very young animals would have been very highly agile, but even the adults would have had relatively quick sort of snapping movements of the eyes and the head and the neck. The scan also reveals a large cavity in the back of the head used by the ear to supercharge the Tyrannosaurus hearing. Having all of these air sinuses in the back part of the skull has the effect of changing the, the acoustic properties of the middle ear such that it becomes sensitive to low frequency sounds. Low frequency sounds carry for long distances, even over rough terrain and through vegetation. Tyrannosaurs probably were using this, this potentially infrasound, sounds lower than what we can even hear, as part of its predatory prey tracking mechanisms what it was able to do was to actually track animals without seeing them. Dr. Whitmer's CT scans have revealed that Tyrannosaurs had senses that were highly developed specifically for hunting. Tyrannosaurs have these long distance prey tracking mechanisms. Uh, the sense of smell that allows them to pick up the odors of prey on the wind. The low frequency hearing that allows them to, to hear the movements of, of animals they can't even see. But when they get close, they have the sense of vision that allows them to keep their fleeing prey firmly within their crosshair as they chase them across the terrain. This evidence might at last remove any doubt that tyrannosaurs were hunters. Looking at uh, the CT scans of the brain of a Tyrannosaurus rex or any of the other Tyrannosaurs, I think reconfirms in my mind that these things are predatory animals. Dr. Curry's theory is that not only were they hunters, but that they did so in packs. That implies that they had another crucial skill, teamwork. Well, pack hunting is a really sophisticated behaviour. It requires intelligence and the ability to interact socially with other animals, and also, some, to some extent, planning and division of tasks within a pack. Did these monsters really have the intelligence to work together as a team? Dr. Whitmer's scan reveals another big surprise kind of blows my mind that we can actually do the CT scanning, pull the data into the, into the computer, and see what the brain structure is like. And it's even more amazing that we can actually print it out in three dimensions, and that's life-size. This is big. And yeah, that looks pretty big. The cast shows that a Tyrannosaur's brain was roughly six times bigger than that of other dinosaurs at the time. By looking at that area, can you actually say something about the social behavior in these animals? Well, I can tell you, I wish what we could do is actually point to sort of like a, a cooperative hunting lobe of the brain. Sadly, it doesn't really work that way. It is the size of the cerebrum, the main part of the brain, that allows Dr. Whitmer to estimate how advanced their behavior might have been. When we actually see expansion of those higher centers, expansion of the cerebrum, that probably we can be pretty safe to assume that these guys did have some pretty sophisticated behaviors that they were able to engage in. There's absolutely nothing in the brain to say that it could not have complex social behavior. 
No, I think, in fact, they may have actually had the cognitive power to have been communal hunters. The results of the CT scan appear to give Dr. Curry the proof he needs for his theory about tyrannosaurs. Until now, mammals were thought to have been the first organized hunters. It now looks like tyrannosaurs were working together millions of years earlier. They had the highly developed senses of an efficient predator and the brain capacity to be able to hunt as a team. In their heads, they had all of the tools they needed to be effective predators. Senses of vision and smell and hearing to track prey, to run them down and to capture them. But even more importantly, locked up within their skull was a brain that gave them the capacity to actually hunt and to hunt successfully and to kill. Some predatory dinosaurs were actually quite intelligent and sociable. So pack hunting is not out of the picture, but it's certainly controversial. If young tyrannosaurs are quick and agile, and the adults slower but clever, how does a dino gang work? Another apex predator using similar tactics today might show Dr. Curry just how deadly a pack hunt can be. A scan of a 70 million year old skull has confirmed Dr. Phil Curry's theory that tyrannosaurs had evolved into extremely efficient predators. It also showed that they had the brain capacity to be team players. If they did hunt in packs, how did they do it? There's no doubt at all in my mind that uh, the whole system would have been a lot more efficient if in fact there were other tyrannosaurs that were part of this group that were built for doing the record. And then you've got something that behaviorally is much more effective than a single animal hunting. Dr. Curry has come to the Swalu Game Reserve in South Africa to see how a modern hunter has become the apex predator by working as a team. Millions of years separate today's African plains from the ancient Gobi. The wildlife here is as plentiful and varied as it was back then. And the same rules of nature still apply. There are the hunted and the hunters. Living off these herds of herbivores is one of the fiercest predators alive today. 500 pounds of muscle, sharp claws, and vice-like jaws armed with deadly teeth. Just as Tyrannosaurus ruled the prehistoric plain, here the lion is king. For a degree. Yeah. It's a cool day in the Kalahari. Observing the pride, Dr. Curry understands the lion's secret to successful pack hunting. Start them young. Lionesses care for their cubs for up to two years. It's a long learning process that teaches them essential survival skills. There's no question at all that with uh, social predators, uh, one of the biggest advantages is not just clustering together and being able to protect each other and join together to, to hunt together. It's, it's the fact that the young learn from the adults so they have a much better chance of surviving than other species of predators that uh, don't have this kind of social behavior. Looking at them here, they look very peaceful and um, almost friendly. But I suspect at night it's a different game. Once the sun goes down, the lions go to work. The adults go off to get dinner while those too young to join in stay behind, honing their hunting skills through play. 
Dr. Curry doesn't have to wait long before the youngsters meet their first real challenge, a porcupine. Its sharp quills keep the lion at bay, much like an armored dinosaur might have done against a Tyrannosaurus. Millions of years ago, the rookie lion needs help. Teamwork soon solves the prickly problem. It's precisely this close cooperation between mammals that some scientists don't believe would have been possible between tyrannosaurs. You would think it would be better if a tyrannosaur could cooperate to eat something spiky. But I doubt the idea would even cross their tiny reptile brains. Now the older lions go into action. This is what Dr. Curry has come to see. The transformation from a family group into a tight hunting pack. What I'm really keen to see here is, is how these animals actually interact when they hunt. And that's a clue to trying to understand what was going on back in the Cretaceous. The scent of prey is in the air. The hunt is on. They go into a stalking mode. Each member of the pride seems to know exactly what it has to do. They communicate silently. Their victims unaware that they are being surrounded. The younger animals are the ones that are doing most of the hunting because they're the ones that are the fastest and most capable of doing it. It's the adults that have the experience and also have the power, so the combination of the two is pretty deadly to potential prey animals. Gang members spread out left and right, spooking the herd sending them straight into the jaws of the more experienced adults who lie in wait. It's also fast, so efficient, that it only takes a couple of minutes before dinner is served. Hunting is hard work, so the lions sleep most of the day to conserve energy for the next hunt. Gang hunting has a lot of advantages. It's actually hard to believe that communal hunting wouldn't have evolved 70 million years ago, potentially in tyrannosaurs. They were actually quite sophisticated animals who could understand their environment and interact with each other in complex ways. Tyrannosaurs were incredibly successful animals for most of the late Cretaceous. And there was no question at all that what they were doing worked. Over that period of time, they unquestionably had uh, lots of time to develop their instincts for cooperative hunting at some level. Dr. Curry's quest has shown that the behavior of today's predators very probably evolved many millions of years earlier than we thought. If that is the case, how does that affect our ideas about our own evolution? Dinosaur expert Dr. Phil Curry has been on a quest to find evidence for his theory that tyrannosaurs were far more intelligent and dangerous than we thought. They hunted in bloodthirsty packs millions of years before mammals did. In Alberta, Canada, he unearths more than 20 tyrannosaur skeletons lying near to each other, proof perhaps that they might have lived in a group. But one bone bed isn't sufficient evidence. In Mongolia's Gobi Desert, there are at least 11 tyrannosaur fossils lying close to each other. 
comparing the leg bones of a young Tyrannosaur to that of an adult, Dr. Curry discovers that the juveniles were built to be much lighter and therefore faster. He notices that the leg bones of a young Tyrannosaur are very similar to those of an ostrich, the fastest two-legged creature on Earth. Juvenile Tyrannosaurs must therefore have run at similar speeds, close to 45 miles per hour. But the adults were still too heavy to be fast and agile hunters. Were they forced to become scavengers? Observing the behavior of the ancient Komodo dragons, Dr. Curry realizes that Tyrannosaurs probably behaved in a similar way. Like all predators, they most likely hunted and scavenged when the opportunity arose. As the Komodos finish feeding, Dr. Curry understands why there are so few skeletons of prey dinosaurs among the Tyrannosaur fossils in Alberta and the Gobi. It's because, like the Komodos, Tyrannosaurs ate everything, including the bones. A CT scan of a Tyrannosaur skull shows that they had the brain size and sensory capabilities to make them exceptional pack hunters. What we can see now is that T-Rex wasn't that old, sort of slow-moving, dull-witted predator of the past. Our new studies are showing that Tyrannosaurs were fast, agile animals that could move, potentially even together in communal packs. Dr. Curry believes that the combination of fast youngsters and slower adults in a hunting pack is very similar to the strategy employed by lions. But pack hunting implies an awareness of self and understanding the intentions of the others around you. It implies planning, strategy, and thought of potential outcome. It means understanding that you may not make the kill, but you will get to eat it. Tyrannosaurs had these skills, it would mean that this social intelligence existed millions of years before previously thought. The evidence right now is strongly suggesting that uh, dinosaurs in their peak were highly adapted animals. They were warm-blooded, very successful and very diverse. They should have survived. The extinction of practically all dinosaurs is mostly blamed on one cataclysmic event probably an asteroid that crashed into the Earth and dramatically changed our world's climate. But scientists now wonder if this alone could have been responsible for ending such a successful diversity of life. Dinosaurs had by now been around for 150 million years. Some scientists believe that they were already on their way out by the time the asteroid struck. About seven million years before we get to the end of the Cretaceous period, until the time when dinosaurs actually finally become extinct, we see a decline in the numbers. There are fewer types of dinosaur around in the world, and it seems that something is already starting to affect their diversity and actually to hit them just before the extinction hits. Probably because of local climatic changes and shifts in some of the ecosystems, and these are the same kind of things that we're seeing today. This is the crux of Dr. Curry's quest. Re-evaluating how Tyrannosaurs behaved could give us indications about our own behavior and what we're doing to the world today. Maybe what we can learn from the extinction of the dinosaurs is that nothing can be successful forever. Sometimes we think that the ancient world is very different than today, and yet in many ways, the play has always been the same. And what we're changing is the actors over time. I don't think dinosaurs did anything unique. They did it very well at that time, but the same process is going on, the same play is still being enacted today. 
The skills that were developed millions of years ago by creatures like Tyrannosaurus are the same skills that eventually made us the apex predators of the world today.